So I'm talking today about using data to improve patient care in CKD. And what I will argue is that it really is not super complicated. We just need to look at our data and use it and put it into practice. Um, we are collecting so much data on people these days that, you know, I think it's kind of a waste if we don't use it. Um, okay, so my disclosures, I have no re relevant financial relationships. Um, I'm on the KDGO Executive Committee, the NKF Scientific Advisory Board, the USRDS Advisory Board, and the editorial boards of Jason, C. Jason, and AJKD. And I receive funding from NIH and NKF. I think none of that really, really merits disclosure so much. Um, okay, so first of all, um, data. So I think in order to use data, you need to be collaborative and, and know where to get it. Um, I am super fortunate to be the co-PI of the CKD Prognosis Consortium. So along with Joe Korash, who is sitting here right next to me, um, we are um, a global consortium. This is how we've grown over the years. Uh, we've grown from about 45 cohorts to now over 80 cohorts from around the world, um, over 20 million participants and over 250 collaborators, which is really cool to meet you know, clinicians from around the world. Um, and everyone has different takes on things and that's super interesting. Um, these are the countries in which um, our cohorts come from. You can see we are sort of lacking in Africa. So if anyone has, um, you know, uh, cohorts in Africa or, or investigators that they know in Africa, we would love to have them join. Um, I've highlighted in blue here, some of the electronic health record um, cohorts that, um, I, in particular, collaborate with um, regarding medication use. Um, so Geisinger is here in the U.S., it's in Pennsylvania. Optum is um, an insured um, uh, data set of about 100 million patients. Scream um, is all of Stockholm in Sweden, and Maccabi is one of the four healthcare systems in Israel. Okay, so how do we use data? Um, so first of all, I just show you how we used it to inform the staging system of chronic kidney disease. Um, and just to start off with, because I just don't know if I know the audience so well, um, what is GFR and why do we need to know it? So GFR is a physiologic property that varies by time of day and proximity to feeding. Um, and the reason why we need to know it is because it's super important for prognosis. A person's GFR relates to risk of ESKD, cardiovascular disease, mortality. Um, screening a person's GFR relates to risks of concomitant laboratory abnormalities. So you need to know someone's GFR in order to know how often you need to monitor things. Drug dosing. Um, and that is where I've been focusing quite a bit. Um, but a person's GFR really determines the rapidity of metabolism of many different drugs and substances. Um, for example, vancomycin. I think you've probably all seen that in the hospital. Okay, so starting with prognosis. So using data from the CKD Prognosis Consortium, we were able to show that there is a very strong relationship um, between GFR, which is here on the x-axis, and risk of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and stage kidney disease. You can see here the hazard ratio is 8,192. So that is a huge hazard ratio. Um, acute kidney injury, progressive CKD. And what these different lines represent are levels of albuminuria. So black line is um, albuminuria of, um, I guess I say it's blue here, but I would say it's black on my screen. Um, so it's um, al A1, um, um, albuminuria less than 30 milligrams per gram. Um, green is between 30 and 300, and red is over 300 milligrams per gram. So here there are independent risk factors for all of these adverse outcomes. Put another way, you can put it into this heat map. Um, and so on the top is what we call A stage and on the side is G stage. Um, and these hazard ratios were then used to develop what we call the C CGA staging in CKD. Um, so these green um, boxes are people that don't have CKD um, and everything else is considered CKD. So I think, um, one of the things when I, when I speak to people that are not nephrologists is I think sometimes people forget that albuminuria also gives you CKD. Um, so if someone has albuminuria that persists for more than three months, um, they are considered to be um, having CKD. And you can, people, you can see that people who have albuminuria greater than 300 are really 
as high risk as people um, who have you know, 3B, so a GFR between 30 and 44, but no albuminuria. So this is really important to look at. And if you take away one thing from this talk, I would say measure albuminuria, it's super important. Okay, um, in terms of screening, another thing that we've done is looked at um, the prevalence of different abnormalities by G stage and A stage. So here, I know these things are tiny, um, but you can see that anemia, um, it gets worse with G stage. Hyperparathyroidism gets worse with G stage. Hyperkalemia gets worse with G stage. Hyperphosphatemia gets worse worse with G stage, acidosis, hypocalcemia. Um, whereas with A stage, the screening, it really doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, so there's a strong relationship with concomitant laboratory abnormalities with G stage, but less so with A stage. Okay, um, how do we measure GFR? Um, I think this is pretty important. It's, it's been in the news a lot recently. Um, there is a new GFR estimating equation. It's called eGFR creatinine CKD-EPI 2021. Um, and so where previous estimating equations incorporated um, um, race, um, so it was categorized as black race versus non-black race, um, this, this equation only incorporates serum creatinine age and sex. Um, and I'm hoping that you all have converted. Um, this is the recommended equation by um, the NKF, which is the National Kidney Foundation, and also ASN, which is the American Society of Nephrology. Along with this recommendation, however, um, there was also a recommendation to use cystatin C um, to facilitate increased routine and timely use of cystatin C, um, especially to confirm GFR and clinical decision making. So um, I know at Hopkins, we recently rolled it out and um, it's now available 24 seven. Um, and I think the National Kidney Foundation is really embarking on an effort to try to get cystatin C more widely available and cheaper to do. Um, and I just wanna show you some examples of why it's important. So as you may or may not know, creatinine is not just a measure of people's kidney function. Um, it's also a measure of muscle mass. Um, it's also related to certain medications. Um, for instance, Bactrim affects um, creatinine concentrations. And so um, certain situations, um, measuring cystatin C in addition to creatinine could help you get a better sense of where someone's GFR is. Um, so people who have very low albumin, um, cystatin C can help low creatinine generation, such as critical illness or frailty, um, extremes of muscle mass and amputees. And this study, I just love to quote it because I think it's so cute, um, but this is um, a study of VA patients. Um, so they're only 24, um, but they had collected their blood samples pre-major amputation and post-major amputation. And these are all young, healthy men, I believe. Um, and you can see what happens to their creatinine after amputation is it goes down by a lot. So it looks like just by having a major amputation, this person's GFR rose to 122, whereas instead there's really no difference in, in cystatin C. Um, so in, in these situations, um, it is helpful to measure cystatin C. Now, what do you do if there's discrepancies in statin, in um, the difference between EGFR creatinine and EGFR cystatin? So here you can also look at data. Um, and I would say you don't ignore it. Um, people with lower cystatin C, GFR based on cystatin C compared to EGFR based on creatinine are at higher risk. Um, they're at higher risk of hospitalizations, they're at higher risk of falls, they're at higher risk of mortality, they're at higher risk of cardiovascular events. So if you have someone with a GFR based on creatinine and you think, mm, I should probably measure EGFR cystatin, and that EGFR cystatin is markedly different than people and then the EGFR based on creatinine, this is something to pay attention to and, and increase monitoring. Okay, um, and then to my favorite subject, um, which is albuminuria. Um, how should we measure albuminuria? So remember, CKD is not staged just based on on G stage, but also on A stage. Um, and how do we do A stage? We measure urine albumin creatinine. That's typically the best method. Um, sometimes it's called UACR, sometimes it's called ACR, um, sometimes it's called microalbumin. Um, it's all kind of the same thing, just measure that. Um, 
there's also a question of, you know, should you measure first morning void or 24 hour collection? In general, first morning void is just as good as 24 hour collection. Um, a random sample in the middle of the day is less good, but still it's better than nothing. Um, now, some of you may ask why ACR, why not protein to creatinine ratio? Um, and the reason is that urine contains many different types of proteins. Um, different measure, measurement procedures, meaning, you know, what you do at Georgetown is different than what is done at Hopkins, which is what is different, which is done at Quest and LabCorp. And so you can't really harmonize all of those. Um, standardization of urine protein assays is then likely impossible. Um, however, standardization of urine albumin is underway. So, you know, what you get at one lab, it's gonna be very similar to what you would get at the other lab, um, et cetera. Um, we did, um, and I will get to this, we did develop a, um, a calculator that converts PCR to ACR, so protein to creatinine ratio to um, albumin to creatinine ratio. However, especially in the low range, this is not a good thing. So for most patients that you're going to see that you know, don't have four grams of albuminuria, um, measuring albumin to creatinine ratio is much, much pre preferable to protein to creatinine ratio. Measuring anything is great though. Okay, next. So talking about data to inform risk prediction. So um, one of my, I guess my other soapboxes is risk prediction. I think it's so important in patient care. Um, you know, we tend to sort of intuitively think about risk, but we don't have numbers often to help us drive, you know, clinical action. Um, so why do we need risk prediction in chronic kidney disease? Well, I would argue, first of all, chronic kidney disease is super common. Um, you know, this doesn't matter what kind of um, filtration marker you use. If you say EGFR creatinine or EGFR cystatin, um, really the prevalence is over, you know, five to 8%, and especially in older people, it could be upwards of 40%. Also, as, as uh, Dr. Choi was saying, um, GFR decline is heterogeneous. So it's hard to predict who's going to go down and who's going to go up and who's going to be stable. Um, and so for that, you know, we need to use risk prediction tools. And why does it matter to sort of guess what the EGFR decline is going to be? Well, we need to prepare people. Um, so, you know, a lot of people that start dialysis are ill prepared for dialysis. Um, as a profession, we've not done a good job figuring out who needs referral for dialysis or transplant patients or planning. Um, a lot of people that start dialysis start with a catheter rather than a fistula or a graft, which is considered sub suboptimal. And, you know, sort of on the earlier stage of disease, a lot of people that require medications to um, prevent or forestall GFR decline are not referred to a nephrologist or are not started on the medications. And so for that, we really need to be better at identifying high-risk patients. Um, again, people with CKD are at high risk for multiple outcomes, including CVD and death. And so figuring out who is that high risk person so that we can, you know, follow them more, more carefully is important. Um, and we know that patients are really undertreated for CVD risk. So this is just in, um, from the NHANES, which is a national survey. So looking at patients that have CKD. So again, this is GFR less than 60 or albumin to creatinine ratio greater than 30. So, you know, 38% have a sedentary lifestyle, 38% have high cholesterol, 17% are still smoking, 20% um, of the patients with hypertension don't know that they have hypertension, 41% who have hypertension are aware but have uncontrolled um, hypertension. And then among the patients with diabetes, 20, 28% have uncontrolled diabetes. So I think really recognizing CKD as a cardiovascular risk factor and focusing on those high risk patients could do wonders for um, patient outcomes. So um, I recently moved to NYU to lead the division of precision medicine. So I think if we were better at recognizing risk, um, we could better tailor treatment plans, which I think is the essence of precision medicine. Um, we can ensure appropriate therapies to the subgroups of patients that benefit most from them. Um, we could better, better monitor and refer for nephrology and access placement and transplantation, and we could improve patient counseling. So um, how, how do I think about risk? Um, so this is basically, um, I don't know, the, the, the 
progression of CKD, a model of um, CKD progression. So people start out normal, then they become at increased risk for CKD. Uh, then often they, they show signs of damage, which is albumin, um, high albuminuria. Then GFR goes down and then people develop kidney failure and, and eventually die. Um, but at all of these stages, there are complications as well. Um, so, you know, the typical complications are, as we talked about, anemia and hyperparathyroidism, but also cardiovascular disease. Um, so we, so I guess starting here, um, I think measuring albuminuria, of course, is the first step. So here, we're here at damage. And I will tell you that we're not that great at measuring albuminuria. Um, it's been a long-standing component of guidelines for the evaluation of CKD. Um, but you can see here, um, this is um, 2.3 million adults with hypertension and 1.3 million adults with diabetes. Um, and overall, each of these lines represents a different health system. Um, overall, only 35% of patients with diabetes had um, an albumin to creatinine test in two years. Um, you can see that some systems are better than others, but in general, 35% is not great. And hypertension, we're doing even worse. Um, so only 4% of people with hypertension had an albumin to creatinine ratio um, in, in the two year screening period. Now, what this is on the x axis is we made it a little bit trickier and we said, you know, is it actually that doctors are doing a great job? They just know who's going to be high risk. Um, and so they're screening the high risk people. And if that were the case, you would expect a line sort of like this um, a line of identity. But no, the lines are pretty flat. So the the um, uh, the incidence of screening albuminuria does not at all correspond with the predicted probability of albuminuria. So high risk patients aren't getting screened more than low risk patients, let's say. And what this, um, uh, the effect of this is that we are just not detecting most people with albuminuria. So we estimated that the ratio of undetected to detected albuminuria is 19.5 in hypertension and 1.8 in diabetes. And that's important because there are medications now that we use to treat albuminuria. There's, you know, the, the advent of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1s and ACE inhibitors and MRAs. Uh, I think all of those are really being underutilized in our high-risk patients. Um, again, I talked about um, how you measure albumin to creatinine ratio. And, you know, here we did develop this calculator where we can estimate albumin to creatinine ratio from protein to creatinine ratio or dipstick. But I will caution you that um, if you're using it to screen in people that have ACR greater than 30, um, the specificity is only 87%. So if you remember from medical school, spin in, snout out, you know, sensitivity out. Um, so ruling in people, this is not a good number for ruling in people. Um, so really, you know, for your high risk patients, you should be doing urine albumin to creatinine ratio. Um, okay, other risk calculators. Um, so we've developed risk calculators for basically every stage of this diagram. Um, so we've looked at risk of kidney failure with, um, requiring um, renal replacement therapy among kidney donor um, candidates. We've looked at risk of incident GFR less than 60. We've looked at risk of 40% decline in GFR. We've looked at um, risk of kidney failure um, for people with eGFR less than 60. And we've looked at... Um, risk of kidney failure, cardiovascular disease, or death for people less than 30. Um, and then we've also looked at cardiovascular risk for people with CKD. Um, you know, one of the knocks in, in CKD um, in using, you know, the standard cardiovascular disease risk equations like the pooled cohort equation um, or Framingham or SCORE um, is that there's no adjustment for people with, cardio, uh, with chronic kidney disease. And so um, potentially these, these risk equations don't work very well. Okay, so first starting on probably the most widely used and most validated equation, which is the kidney failure risk equation. Um, and here it is, the, this is our website, ckdpcrisk.org. Um, you can find all of these risk calculators there. So what um, the KFRE is, um, is it predicts the two and five year absolute risk of kidney failure for patients with um, GFR less than 60. 
So you put in age, sex, region being um, North America or non-North America, um, GFR, and you're an albumin to creatinine ratio, um, and like this, um, and you get a two-year and five-year risk. Um, so, you know, this person has a 41% risk of developing um, kidney failure, which is um, kidney failure requiring dialysis or transplant in the next two years. So that is pretty high. Um, so at this level, we would definitely refer this person for um, a transplant and also potentially for a fistula if they decided that they wanted hemodialysis. Now, how was the KFRE developed? Um, it was developed... Um, um, and the, the lead author of this was Nav Tangri, who's in Canada. So he used two Canadian cohorts um, and he tested all of these different um, um, variables, GFR, age, sex, um, uh, albumin to creatinine ratio, diabetes, hypertension, systolic blood pressure, diast diastolic blood pressure, body weight, serum albumin, phosphate, bicarbonate, and calcium. And what he found was that the four variable, which is GFR, age, sex, and ACR, performed really just as well um, as the eight variable, which incorporates um, these other laboratory um, values. And so out of convenience now, um, we typically use the four variable um, simply because serum albumin and serum phosphate are not as available as um, GFR and calcium and bicarbonate. Um, and it works, you know, just really just only a teeny, teeny bit worse than the eight, eight variable KFRE. Um, and then, you know, I think before it was really rolled out sort of wide worldwide, um, you know, part of, the, part of the concern was this was only two cohorts and they were Canadian. Um, and, you know, it's not the most, um, the most diverse cohort that they have. Um, so they came to us in the CKDPC and they said, can you validate it for us? Um, so we then looked at it in 15 North American cohorts and 14 non-North American cohorts, um, overall 721,000 participants. And I will say it worked really, really well. Um, kind of surprising because it's only four variables. Um, but, you know, the C statistic was 0.91 overall in North America and 0.9 in non-North America. Um, what was a little bit off was calibration. So what these are, each of these circles represents a cohort. Um, and this represents the adjusted, after you've adjusted for, you know, the same age, the same sex, GFR, ACR, what the baseline risk would be. And so this line right here was the um, original baseline risk. And you see that you, if you average over all the cohorts, the North American cohorts lie right on top of that line. However, the European cohorts or the non-North American cohorts were generally lower. Um, and I think that this is real. Um, I think part of that is because um, dialysis is a choice. And um, I think in the US, we tend to be more aggressive in offering dialysis um, to many people than in other countries outside of North America. Um, but because of this, we um, developed a calibration factor. So that's why when you look back on this, here, um, you need to put in region. Oh, should have shown you here. Um, okay, so how do I use this in patient care? Um, so let's say we have a 39 year old man, his GFR is 25 and he has four grams per day of albuminuria. You calculate his KFRE, he's extremely high risk. He's 55% risk of kidney failure in two years, 92% in five years. So I refer for kidney disease education, for transplant evaluation, for vascular access placement if he wants hemodialysis. How can you incorporate this skill or this, this risk calculator at the division level or at the health system level? Um, you know, what we've done at Hopkins is we um, make a patient panel. So you see all the people that are high two-year KFRE risk. And you can say, you can look at what's the frequency of visits. Um, are they highest among people with high two-year KFRE? Um, have all of the people with high-risk KFRE um, been referred for education? Are they all being seen in nephrology clinics, hopefully? Um, and then, you know, the other thing that I think we always need to talk about are have goals of care been documented? Um, because not we don't want these people to end up in the hospital needing dialysis and have never talked about it with anyone. 
Uh, the low risk scenario is also useful, I think. Um, so here, let's say there's a 78 year old woman, she's got a GFR of 20, and she only has four milligrams per day of albuminuria. So this woman is extremely low risk. She's 2% um, risk of kidney failure in the next two years, 6% in the, in the next five years. Um, and I think people like this really like to hear that they're low risk, um, you know, because you keep on hearing, oh, your GFR is 20% of where it should be. Oh, no, oh, no. When Really, you can say, you know, the most important things for you are risk factor modification and, and making sure you're getting all the drugs dosed correctly. Um, at the division or health system level, what you can do is you can look and divide the patient panel by five-year risk. Um, you can see that the extremely low patients maybe don't even need to be seen by nephrology. Um, so, you know, that can be left up to patient preference, but um, you can really subdivide who needs to be seen, who needs to be seen more frequently. Um, and, you know, this is the way that they are using it in Canada right now. They're using KFRE for everyone. If they have a um, lower than 3% risk, they're seen just by their family doctor. If the um, risk is between 3 and 9%, um, seen by the nephrologist, and over 10%, it's seen, um, they're seen by a multidisciplinary clinic. So nephrologist, nurse, social worker, pharmacist, dietitian. Um, and all these, I, these ways are, you know, ways of using care for the highest risk patients to hopefully optimize um, patient outcomes. Uh, okay, the next risk calculator I will talk about is um, the EGFR less than 30 um, calculator. So, you know, as I've been saying, the risk of cardiovascular disease is also quite high among patients um, with, um, with um, CKD. And so really knowing what the risk of CVD is and the risk of death um, can also help drive patient management. So this was a little bit trickier. There were 29 cohorts. There are 264,000 participants. Um, and we used Markov models to figure out all these different pathways. Um, and with that, you can say, all right, so this person um, has a 11% risk of kidney failure, a 40% risk of cardiovascular disease, and a 36% risk of death. How do we how do we use this in actual patient care? So, you know, consider an 80 year old woman who's got a GFR of 20 and only four milligrams per day of albuminuria. She's really quite low risk for end stage kidney disease, but she is high risk for death. Um, so, you know, for her, we, we would really wanna optimize drug dosage, um, make sure that she's not taking too high doses of anything that would, you know, potentially predispose her for falls um, or adverse drug events. Um, and, you know, she probably doesn't need to be sent for um, a fistula placement, even though her GFR is low. Um, at the division level, you can also use this to ensure patients with high CVD risk are adequately treated. Um, you know, I think um, what we tend to do as nephrologists, I know less so as, as primary care doctors, but, you know, we focus only on the kidney disease and not on, you know, what, what the greater picture of this patient is. Um, and so, you know, making sure that she's getting the right uh, cardiovascular um, risk factor reduction is important. And then, of course, goals of care documented. If you have a woman who is super high risk for death, I think we need to really make sure that goals of care are documented. Um, so how is this different from KFRE? It's for people with GFR less than 30, not GFR less than 60. It uses more covariates and it predicts multiple events. Um, higher up, in the GFR spectrum or earlier in, in CKD. Uh, we also have risk calculators for incident GFR less than 60 and risk of 40% decline in GFR. Why do we have these? Well, part of it is clinical trials, right? So clinical trials want to enroll pa patients who are most likely to benefit from a, um, given, from a given treatment. Um, so SGLT2 inhibitor trials want to um, enroll people that are at high risk of 40% decline in GFR because they want to actually show that their drugs work. Um, and 40% decline is one of those surrogate endpoints that uh, Dr. Choi mentioned that we were, um, uh, we, we worked with the FDA to get this approved as a, as a surrogate endpoint um, rather than kidney failure. Um, so what do these look like? 
um, you punch in these different numbers and you can get five-year probability of GFR less than 60 or um, for people with or without diabetes. Um, it really does have very good discrimination, meaning that we can show the low risk versus the high risk. There's a big spread. Um, and it's not just related to age, which um, some people would argue. Um, and it's very much related to albumin creatinine ratio. So each of these things is higher um, with higher albumin creatinine ratio. And here the C statistics in general does very well. Um, calibration, so here is testing in external cohorts. Um, and what you wanna see with calibration is that this red line lies right on top of the, of the black line underneath it. And you can see it, it does pretty well. Um, and I will say, you know, I do a lot of um, risk tool development and it's hard to get things calibrated, right? But this one seems to work very well. Uh, okay, moving on to cardiovascular disease risk prediction. Um, so I think probably that's where you all are most familiar with risk prediction. Um, probably you do use Framingham or the pooled cohort equation um, in your everyday work. Um, and I would just argue that the risk tools that we have in kidney disease are actually more accurate um, and better calibrated than some of these. So I think you know it, it's time to use them. Um, so here is just as an example, the pooled cohort equation. Um, so the pooled cohort equation um, predicts 10 year risk of atherosclerotic um, CBD. It doesn't use any kidney measures. Um, it's just um, gender, age, race, cholesterol, HDL, HDL cholesterol, systolic blood pressure, um, diabetes, smoking, and, and um, antihypertensive meds. And what this shows, it's a little bit complicated, um, but we, um, we showed that the calibration of the pooled cohort equation was really not quite, not great. So this red line here is the um, original equation. Um, so the baseline hazard after adjusting out all of those different factors. And all of these dots are all of the cohorts that we tested it in. So it works pretty well for Tromso and Mount Sinai, but everyone else it doesn't really work for. Um, Tromso is a uh, Norwegian and Cardia is way down here. Um, and so we, what we did is we recalibrated. So, and, and we also recognized that the absolute risk varies a lot. So right here in orange is the 50th percentile. Here's the 75th percentile and here's the 25th percentile. And so what we say is, you know, we don't know your cohort, we don't know your health system, but perhaps what you can do is find a um, cohort among these that you think you are similar um, in risk to, and then you can choose that baseline hazard in the risk prediction model. Um, so what happens here is you can then say, you add in your, your measures along with now we've updated with GFR and albuminuria and it will give the original pooled cohort equation, and then it will give it with a CKD patch. And you can see this person who has a gram of albumin to creatinine ratio has a much higher risk than originally um, um, uh, estimated. Um, however, because the calibration is so off in the original, if you move it down to the 50th percentile, it perhaps was sort of similar in the beginning. So maybe this is not a good example. Um, um, but I, I do think, just to drive the point home that these risk tools are even more um, calibrated than a lot of the things that you're already using. Um, so in summary on this risk section is that absolute risk prediction is the foundation for establishing target populations for treatments and trials in CKD. Um, when you're thinking about what risk tool to use, you need to consider the relevant population. Um, so is it an at-risk population? Is it a CKD population? Is it a late CKD population? The relevant outcomes and the relevant time frame. Um, there are many validated risk tools that exist for CKD. Um, I just showed you some of them, um, but I think they're really ready for prime time. Um, okay, now just a little bit in the last 20 minutes on um, data to inform medication prescription. So another thing that I like to do is use electronic health record data um, to really see who's getting which medications and are these medications as effective as we think they are. Um, so one of the first papers that I did on this um, was with a student um, in, he's now in Australia, 
Um, he's a renal attending in Australia. Um, but we looked at um, proton pump inhibitor use and we found that it was linked to incident chronic kidney disease. Um, subsequently, there were many, many different um, papers showing similar things and similar risks um, um, for things like C. diff, diarrhea, um, and fractures, and even pneumonia. Um, we also looked at metformin use. Um, so this was right about the time when the metformin guidelines got, got changed. Um, and um, we show that you know, the metformin guidelines now, they used to be based on creatinine, now they're based on GFR. And they say, don't use metformin in people with GFR less than 30. And what we showed is actually that makes sense, um, that um, the risk of hospitalized acidosis was similar for metformin versus no metformin um, in all of these other categories, except for once your GFR got down below 30. Um, so we thought that this was, you know, very confirmatory um, with the FDA um, change in label. We saw, we've also looked at um, ACE ARB discontinuation and advanced CKD. Um, so one of the sort of clinical questions in chronic kidney disease is, you know, should we stop ACE inhibitors um, as people's GFR decline? You know, as people get very low, um, like less than 30, sometimes we get very nervous about keeping them on the ACE inhibitor. Or we think, oh, the reason why they're declining is because of this acute effect of ACE inhibitor. Whereas, as I've shown you, people who have low GFR are at really high risk for cardiovascular disease. So it's possible that keeping them on ACE or ARBs is actually important to prevent cardiovascular events. And that's exactly what we showed. Um, so this is observational, but we use um, what's called target trial techniques. So um, this is a way to try to um, use um, observational data and get to cause. So pretend, like design your study so that it gets to, yes, the use of the ACE um, seems causally linked to these outcomes. And so what you see is that once people hit below 30, um, the choice to discontinue an ACE or ARB was associated with a higher risk of death compared to the people that continued ACE or ARBs. Um, same thing with MACE, which is major um, adverse cardiovascular events. Um, the people who discontinued ACE um, was very similar, or was, um, uh, was higher um, of having MACE compared to people who continued. Um, and finally, we saw um, a similar signal in end-stage kidney disease However, it was not statistically significant, I think just because we didn't have the numbers there. Um, I will also just sort of call your attention to the y-axis here. Um, so if you look at over five years, um, you know, we've got about 50% of, um, a little less than 50% of people who died um, and over 50% of people who had a major adverse cardiovascular event. On the other hand, people who developed end-stage kidney disease, only about 8% did. Um, so just thinking about this in terms of like, where do I want to focus my efforts? Um, you know, preventing cardiovascular events and death is really important in this population. Um, another paper that we recently um, are working on is um, uh, an idea by Derek Fine. I show this picture here. He's a nephrologist at Hopkins. Um, and uh, really elegantly performed by Zhang Yim Shin. Um, so here, um, the question was, is rosuvastatin associated with increased risk of hematuria and proteinuria? So um, one of the problems in pre-approval clinical trials for rosuvastatin was that it was reported to have a higher incidence of hematuria and proteinuria than otorvastatin at the high doses. Um, and Derek Fine came to me one day and he's like, I just really think that rosuvastatin is still associated with proteinuria, even at the lower doses. And so I said, okay, well, let's, let's check, let's see. Um, and it turns out, in fact, that he's right. Um, so here we used Optum. Um, and so we did a target trial um, emulation. Um, so basically setting up sort of a pseudo trial within observational data, where we compare people that initiated on rosuvastatin to people who initiated on atorvastatin. Um, and then we said, you know, all things being equal, um, you know, all of their comorbidities being equal, um, let's 
pretend, um, let's set up this sort of statistical pretend trial where we randomize people to atorvastatin versus rosuvastatin. And what we see is that this is stratified by GFR. So, um, uh, the Um, the risk gets higher with lower GFR, um, but you can see that each line is lower. So, so resuvastatin is associated with higher risk at all levels of GFR. Um, and we, this is in review right now, and one of the reviewers was like, well, who cares about, um, you know, who cares about hematuria and proteinuria, which I find like, huh, I care about it. Um, but they said, what about hard outcomes? And so we hadn't originally looked at it um, just because we thought the event number would be so small. Um, but in fact, it is associated with end-stage kidney disease as well. Um, so a slightly higher incidence of end-stage kidney disease overall. And then within each of these strata, now the numbers are too small to make them statistically significant. Um, but you can see, you know, in the strata of um, GFR less than 30, it probably results in about eight additional, eight to nine additional cases per thousand person years. Um, so that's not nothing. Then we looked at, are people being dosed correctly? Um, and I think um, maybe some of you don't know, but um, the FDA in, in sort of looking at the label and the increased risk of hematuria and proteinuria, uh, they said, all right, we can approve it. However, for people who have GFR less than 30, the maximum dose that they should be on is 10. Um, and so we looked at it and we said, all right, is, what's the distribution of doses by GFR? And you can see that you know, here it's 45% of people who have GFR less than 30 who are taking resuvastatin were on too high of a dose. Um, I didn't show here, but there was also a dose response with each of those um, outcomes. Um, so I think when you see your patients in, in clinic or when you see your patient, your patients with very low GFR, just make sure that you're, you're uh, dosing their subastatin correctly. Another thing we did was, um, this is led by a really, really amazing doctoral student, Lucy, Lucy Chow. Um, and, um, you know, uh, one of the pushbacks on measuring albuminuria is, well, does it even really change management? And so what she very beautifully showed is, yes, it changed management. Um, as you measure albuminuria and albuminuria is higher, um, people are much more likely to start an ACE or an ARB. Um, so it's a key step in optimal medical management. Uh, another thing that we've done is just look at statin use in people with CKD. Um, so as you may know, uh, people with CKD who are over 50 are indicated by guidelines that they should be on a statin. Um, and here we show that, you know, people um, on are, are really not on a statin. Only about 60% of people with diabetes and only about 30% of people without diabetes who are otherwise indicated for a statin are on it. We also can look at uptake of diabetes medications. So this is across three different um, healthcare systems. Um, so this is US, Sweden, Israel, and these, I don't expect you to read them, but blue is sulfonylureas, which is really not recommended um, for anyone anymore in, in diabetes. Orange is insulin. Purple is SGLT2 inhibitors, which is definitely preferred in this sort of CKD um, group here. And, and the brown is GLP-1s. Um, and you can see that we're really not doing a great job of prescribing people the optimal medication. Um, and, you know, in the US, in Sweden, we're not doing great. Um, maybe a little bit better in Maccabi, um, particularly with the DPB-4s, so they're, they're prescribing quite a bit. Um, but I think, you know, one of these things is to say, look, we need to be pushing the right medications. Um, so here's a summary, a tiny summary of this last section, which is um, I think post-marketing surveillance is possible and important. Um, clinical trials are sometimes unethical um, and sometimes they're just too hard. And so we need to use target trial um, emulation techniques to look at things um, that are relevant to our patients. Um, measurement of our practice patterns is necessary. Uh, if we don't know how well we're adhering to guideline recommendations, it's really hard to improve. 
And then just to push again for the risk tools, we have validated risk tools, we should implement them. And they help everyone, I think, see the forest for the trees. So finally, I'll end on hopefully a positive note that um, I think implementation is possible. Um, I think we are all now at the point where we can push things back into the electronic medical record. Um, so at Hopkins, um, we recently pushed in the, the kidney failure risk equation into EPIC. So um, here it lines up on the storyboard. This is called the storyboard right here. Um, and if you hover over it, it will give the patient's kidney failure risk equation. Um, we also incorporated it as a smart data element, um, which can be incorporated in notes using the smart phrase um, KFRE score. Um, the other thing that we did that I personally love um, is we added a patient insight tab. Um, so either you could type it here or it would show up as one of your little um, tabs here. And it shows the KFRE score. Um, it also shows the risk of cardiovascular disease score. Um, and importantly, it shows the kidney relevant medications um, that people are on over time. And it shows the trajectory of GFR and all of the albuminuria and, and proteinuria readings. Um, Remember that I told you that PCR is not the same thing as ACR. So we do incorporate that risk calculator that we made um, to convert the PCR to ACR. So everything's sort of harmonized um, on the same schedule. Um, however, if you say, you know, I don't believe dipsticks, I don't want to, I don't want to look at them ever, um, you can click on that and they will go away. Um, so I think this is a really useful thing, particularly when I precept in fellows clinic and you don't know the patient quite as well, and you can kind of get a good snapshot of what's been happening over the years. Uh, here's another patient. Um, so this is a hypothetical patient where the GFR is greater than 60, where these would not be calculated, um, but it still does show um, what the patient was taking over the years and the trajectories of GFR and albuminuria. Um, here is another example of a very low risk patient um, and uh, the trajectories. And you can see that um, you can see down here, this person was an ACE inhibitor and this is not real time, but if I were to hover, it will pop up and say ACE inhibitor. And here's an example of a patient who's sort of high risk um, for many different outcomes. So what would you do with this? I think, you know, really the next step is putting in some guidance. Um, so, you know, for instance, put this patient on an SGLT2 inhibitor, consider a GLP-1, make sure they're on a statin, uh, make sure they're on an MRA, make sure they you know, are on optimized heart failure medications. Um, so this is where I see sort of the wave of the future of incorporating all of this sort of obs observational work into the point of care with the patient. Uh, and with that, I will stop and say thank you. Um, you know, uh, I get a lot of funding from the NIDDK, also the National Kidney um, Foundation, and I really thank all of the collaborators at the CKD Prognosis Consortium. Without data, I wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, and Hopkins, where um, I'm, I still have an adjunct appointment, and NYU, where I recently moved. Um, so thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions.